Hello, everybody. As you know, during this uh, 50th anniversary celebration convention, we are also celebrating the life of our friend, mentor, and founder, Glenn St. Charles. And uh, for the next little while, we're going to continue with that celebration. Uh, I first, once again, want to recognize the St. Charles family who's sitting here in front of me. And uh, Rick and Debbie, you're, not, you're included. And uh, we, as a club, and on behalf of the club, I want to thank you for sharing, allowing, and sharing Glenn and Margaret with us all those years. We appreciate it. Most of us in here have a memory of Glenn. We have, uh, we, we all consider him to be our friend. We ask you via email to send us in some photos of you and Glenn, and many of you did. Uh, and at the end of this tribute, we are going to show those, some of those photos up on the screens, and along with a couple of videos. So once we get through, uh, please keep your seats and enjoy uh, uh, what's going to be on the screens. As a special treat tonight, I have asked uh, several of Glenn's friends to come forward and spend a few minutes sharing some fond memories uh, that they have of Glenn. And first person I want to uh, invite up is Billy Ellis. Billy is my uh, dear friend, and Billy is the person who introduced me to Glenn back in the early 90s at his lodge in Mississippi. And uh, Glenn and Margaret both were down there visiting, and I was fortunate enough to, to uh, meet him there. After talking with Glenn for a few minutes, he kind of looked at me kind of kind of funny and he, he said, I, I detect a slight southern accent. And uh, he goes, are you from here? And I went, no sir, I'm not. I'm from north here up in Memphis. And he goes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because your accent isn't nearly as bad as Billy's. <laughs> Billy, come on up. Fifteen years ago, Glenn organized a Central Canadian Barren Ground Caribou Hunt, which took place at McKay Lake, north of Yellowknife, Northwest Territory. And on that hunt, he invited, of course, his two sons, Joe and Jay. He invited Dick and Carol Mock, Rocky Hopenin, Max Thomas, Nathan Anderson, Jack Joseph, Russ Ty, John Evans, and yours truly. And when we were on that hunt, uh, I gave a poem which Glenn loved. Uh, the poem was taught to me by a famous Pope and younger Charlie Crowell on a uh, caribou hunt to Quebec about 35 years ago. Charlie taught me this poem, and Glenn loved it. And every time I saw Glenn, he made me give us this poem. The poem is called Hermit of Sharp to the Show. I'll share it with y'all tonight. Oh, the North Country is a cold country that mothers a bloody brood. Its icy arms hold hidden charms for the greedy, the sinful, the lewd. And strong men lust for the golden dust that sears the Northland soul. But the wicked is born from the pole to the horn with a hermit of sharp to show. That Jacob came was that hermit's name in the days of his pious youth. Ere he cast a smirch on the Baptist church by betraying a maiden named Ruth. He was just a boy in his parson's joy ere he fell for the gold and the muck, for he'd learned to pray with the hogs and the hay on a farm near Keokuk. But a robin service tale of illicit ale and whiskey and women wild drained the morals clean of the soup tureen of that poor but innocent child. And he longed to mush along in the slush with a team of husky hounds and fire his gat on a beaver hat and knock it out of bounds. So he left his home for that hell town gnome on Alaska's ice ribbed shores, and he learned to drink and curse and worse till rum seeped from his pores. 
Now a couple of boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon, and Dan McGrew and his dangerous crew shot craps with a big walloon, and the kid on the stool banged away like a fool in a jig time melody, and the barkeep vowed to the whole damn crowd that he'd cremate Sam McGee. And Jacob Kane, who had taken the name of Yukon Jake the Killer, would rake the dive with his 45 till the atmosphere grew chiller. Without coming to blows, he would tweak the nose of dangerous Dan McGrew, and becoming bolder, fling over his shoulder the lady that's known as Lou. Ah, tough as a stake was Yukon Jake, the hermit of Shark Tooth Shoal. He washed his shirt in the Yukon dirt and he drank his rum by the keg. But meanwhile, miles away in Keokuk, Iowa, did a ruined maiden fight to remove the smirch of the Baptist Church by bringing the heathens to light. For the deacons declared that all would be spared if she took those holy words from a Keokuk home to that hell town gnome and saved those sinful birds. So two weeks later, she hopped a freighter for that hell torn land near the pole. But Helen ain't made for a maid that's betrayed. She was wrecked on Shark Tooth Show. All hands were tossed in the sea and lost, all but the maid Ruth, who swam to the edge of the sea lion's ledge, where abode the love of her youth. He was hunting a seal for his evening meal. He handled a mean harpoon. Then he spat at his feet, not something to eat, but a maid in a frozen swoon whom he dragged by hair to his frozen lair and he rubbed her knees with gin. And to his surprise, she opened her eyes and revealed his original sin. His eight-month beard grew stiff and weird. It looked like a chestnut burr. And he swore by his gizzard in the Arctic blizzard that he'd do right by her. But a hopeless rape was Yukon Jake, that hermit of shark tooth show. And that helpless maid he re-betrayed and wrecked her immortal soul. Then he rolled her ashore with a broken oar and sold her to Dan McGrew for a husky dog and a hot egg nog as rascals will want to do. Now ruthless Ruth is a maid uncouth with painted eyes and lips and she sings rough songs to the drunken throngs who come in off the sealing ships. And just for a kiss from that rude stained mist they would trade a seal slick fur or perhaps a slave if they are able it's all the same to her. Oh, the North Country and the Cold Country that mothers of bloody brood. It's icy arms hold hidden charms for the greedy, the sinful, the lewd. And strong men lust for the golden dust that sears the North man's soul. But the wickedest born from the pole to the horn was a hermit of Shark Tooth Show. Thank you. So, if no one passes on the tradition, it'll slip away more with each generation. Imagine this world looking nothing like it does now. We are so lucky that Ishi came out of hiding, and with his traditions, he was willing to be guided. Of bow hunting, he taught Saxton Pope how. Dr. Pope went on to write the great bow hunting books, with Ishi at the university for all to come and look. Along comes Art Young, a new friend and new scholar. Many great hunts were had by Ishi Young and Pope. Upon their success, traditions had hope. Art told the world of their adventures, and the legends grew taller. In one of those crowds was a young Fred Bear, who took up this bow hunting challenge as if on a dare. Fred Bear set off to build an empire. All across the country, bow hunting was taking form. People throwing down their guns and shutting the norm. In their hearts, bow hunting burned like a fire. Bow hunters and governments were having their quarrels. Then emerged a new leader in Glen St. Charles. He picked up the torch and he fought for our rights. Glen founded a brand new organization focused on bow hunting's revitalization. Bow hunting seasons were at last in our sights. A Pope and Young record book was to be the creation. Bow hunters united all over this nation. For this, they all had the same reason. Bow hunting is viable. Bow hunting is real. Of our traditions and heritage, you cannot steal. At last, we gained our bow hunting seasons. 
Through these and all the legends, our hearts have been touched. To each of these heroes, we owe so much. This bow hunting thing, I think it's gonna last. Tonight, we each honor our founder, our mentor, our friend, our guiding light right to the end. We pick up his torch and we will make sure that it is passed. Thank you.
Spent that day shooting bows with us, telling adventures, listening to adventures patiently, signing all kinds of bows, recurves, long bows, compounds. He signed guns, hats, pie plates, whatever. And uh, he had a great time with us. And um, that night after the banquet, Amy Carpenter and I had a, uh, the privilege of getting to spend a lot of time with Glenn and talk to him. And he showed us the bow he had made. Uh, it had all kind of knots and crooked places in it. But when you strung it up and drew it, boy, it was just like a dream. And while well, lusted after that bow, and he, he had named the bow Naughty But Nice. Well, <laughs> Margaret was at the banquet, and, and she took note that my wife was several months pregnant, my wife Lynn, uh, with our only child. And uh, a few months later, Billy called me, Billy Evans called me and said that uh, Glenn had called him and asked what, uh, what would be a good baby gift for me or for my daughter. And uh, Billy, looking out for me as he has for years, told Glenn that a, uh, a nice 55 to 60 pound take down you <laughs> would be a great gift for the kid. And uh, a few months later, a box arrives in my office. And I'm like, holy crap, it worked. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I pick it up, it's a little light. So I opened it up and it was some beautiful satin pillowcases that Margaret had made for my little girl. And uh, I got them to this day and bless her sweet soul, she hadn't got to lay her head on those. I'm keeping those separate when she has some children. Uh, but I got my present a few months later. Uh, Billy uh, got another message to me that Glenn wanted us to go to the uh, Northwest Territories and McKay Lake Hunt with, with all those guys. And uh, boy, that was the adventure of a lifetime, hunt of a lifetime to get to go on that hunt. And, and um, I, I, you know, you think about things that, you, fantasies you have that, you know, going to a, a rock concert with Mick Jagger or playing football with Paint Manning or, or going on a hunt with Glenn St. Charles. And, and uh, we got invited on that hunt. Well, Andy uh, had to, couldn't go on the hunt due to extenuating circumstances, so uh, he was replaced as my hunting partner by Nathan Anderson, which is, I guess, as close as I'll get to do anything with Mick Jagger. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, the thing that spoke the most to Glenn's class and character on that hunt was uh, on the first day of the hunt, Jack Joseph. Uh, passed away of a heart attack while shooting at a caribou, a hunting caribou. And I first met Jack on that hunt and I just loved him. I just had a great time with him. And, but a lot of those guys had been close to him for many years and we were all let down. Uh, when we came in from the, the first time we found out and we didn't really know what to do. We didn't know whether to uh, stop hunting or, or take a few days or whatever. And, and, and Glenn really kind of pulled a Vince Lombardi on us and he, and he, and he coached us up and, and gave us a pep talk and told us that the, the worst thing we could do to Jack Joseph and his memory would be to stop hunting. We needed to go out and enjoy the hunt. And he got us all fired up again and we had a beautiful ceremony for Jack out there at the time. And uh, so, you know, I just want to thank Glenn St. Charles now, where he is, for inviting me on that hunt because I have to pinch myself because leading back to what I was talking about, about a while ago, I got to hunt with Glenn St. Charles. And uh, thank you, Glenn. Thank you.